So now let's look at style and how we can deal with that. So style, it's hard to say what actually style is. So style is a bunch of things, right? Style may be the colors that are used. The style can be like small little details, like tiny brush strokes. Also can be larger things like in the Van Gogh, the, the uh, swirls and so on. And so it's unclear if you wanted to sort of figure out style information from a neural network, where to look. I mean, at the very first convolutional layers, but if you look at the outputs, that's telling you things about like small things, right? Has to be small. So if we look at the output of the, of the very first convolution, for example, if we've got three by three convolutions, each output is only affected by a three by three part of the world, three by three by three portion of the input here. But so it certainly can't be looking at anything larger than tiny little areas. As we go deeper in the convolutional network, the receptive field of each output is a larger area of the original image. So style probably depends on low-level elements and also depends on some high-level elements as well. So what we are going to do is we're going to actually look at this neural network and we're going to pick out a handful, let's say four or five different outputs. So we're going to say maybe we'll take output from the first convolution layer and, you know, the fifth and the 15th and the 25th and the 30th layers in here. Okay, so we'll get a, a representative sampling of layers, both low level layers and high layers. Right? So we might have, you know, a at layer zero, a you know, at layer 10, a at layer 15, a at layer 20, a at layer 25, perhaps. Low level information up to high level information. But we still need to figure out how we're going to extract some concept of style. Let me give you a demonstration. So let's say we have something very simple. We have a some level of a neural network, let's say it's not this neural network, where what we've got coming out is so we have a two by two by two. Okay. And the first map tells you whether you have a diagonal line. And the second map tells you whether you have green. And we've got an image that's coming in. And this image comes in and it's got, let's say, a diagonal line and a circle and a green diagonal line and a, a green circle. So if we looked at this two by two by two here, well, Roughly, and this is, this is fairly conceptual, I just want to give this idea. So we've got diagonal lines in the left area here. So let me flatten the two by two into two feature maps. So this one is the diagonal one, and this one is the green one. So we can see diagonals sort of yes here and here, and no here and here. How would this be represented? Probably not zeros and ones. This is probably sort of large numbers here and small numbers here. Okay. But I'm going to use ones and zeros. It's just a little easier. And then for the green, how do we look at that? Well, that is zero, zero across the top and one, one across the bottom. So we have one case where we have green and diagonal. And then we have green, no diagonal, diagonal, no green, no diagonal, no green. What we're trying to get a, a sense of for this style is we don't actually care where in this image uh, style happens, right? We're assuming the style kind of happens throughout the, the image. And so what we're going to be interested in is not where something happens, but just when things co-occur. So that is, when do we get diagonals and greens? Well, we can just go ahead and look and do a pointwise multiplication to find out. So we can say diagonal no green, no diagonal no green, diagonal green, diagonal green. 
If we do our dot product, this would equal 1. So we have some diagonal in green. If we had diagonal in green on all four of these areas, so four diagonal greens, then we get a value of 4. So that would say that stylistically, diagonal greens are very important for this style image. If, on the other hand, there were no diagonal greens, then our output of this dot product would be very small. And that would say it's not very important stylistically. But you can imagine there's lots and lots of other maps that can be happening here. And what we can do is look at these co-occurrences and say, how often does this particular feature co-occur with this other particular feature? And we can do that for all possible features. For each co-occurrence, we are calculating what is the dot product between these. So the dot product hides away, right? Let's just show you the dot product again. This is really going towards, we just flatten this into 1, 0, 1, 0. We flatten this into 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, and then we do our dot product. So we're, we're stripping away all of our spatial information, and we're just coming up with a single number, single number for any pair of features. So we're going to have, for a given layer, activations, that is our feature maps. And we have, let's say, k of these, and this is the width, and this is the height. So we're going to calculate for each pair in this k, i, j, we're going to calculate that dot product. So we're going to come up with a big matrix. So this is from 1 all the way to k, from 1 all the way to k. And any entry in here is the dot product of the i feature map with the j feature map. Along the diagonal is going to be the ith feature map with the ith feature map. So we know if we do a dot product, it's going to just intensify uh, whatever is there. So the if we don't have if this feature map is close to zero, then when we dot product it, it's going to be close to zero. If it's large, dot product is going to be large. So we fill in all of these values. So for any given i and j, this is going to be the of 8i and a and j. As far as doing this dot product, if we've got two, two of those we need to do the dot product, we could just calculate this actually as the sum of the first one matrix multiplied with the transpose of this one. So we take the first one, we take the second one, we just take the first one, transpose the second one, multiply them all together. And then we could take the sum of all of those. So when we do this matrix multiply of this guy transpose, then we're going to be multiplying together the right values. This, by the way, has a name. This is the Gram matrix. And again, a reminder, we have k feature maps. We're going to take every pair of feature maps. We are going to go ahead and find the dot product between those, fill in this value, right? fill it in the appropriate value in this matrix, do this for all i, j pairs, and this is our grand matrix. And so, what, again, what this has summarized is which things co-occur, which pairs of styles co-occur. And so we'll get out some numbers in here. Right, this might be 36, these would be floating point numbers, of course, but uh, 36, 2, you know, 7, 83, 5, 0, and so on. 
And this is going to be our fingerprint of a style for this layer. Right? This is done for a particular layer in here. And so we're going to say, OK, when we feed in the style image, it will cause some particular output from this particular convolution layer. We're going to go ahead and take that output, create a gram matrix, and that now is our summary of the style at that layer. We're going to do this for all of our layers. So we're going to compute gram matrix, and we're going to compute a gram matrix. We're going to compute a gram matrix, and a gram matrix, and a gram matrix. And then we'll just save those. That is our understanding of what the style is of this style image. And then we can do the same thing for the combination image. Go ahead and calculate those same gram matrices, and then it's simple enough to just do a mean squared error between. So the loss with respect to the style of combination image is going to be what? We're going to go ahead and have a loss for every one of the chosen layers. So it's going to be the average loss and some A at L, right, for our different lo losses. So we'll just assume we calculate uh, loss for the style with respect to the first and the tenth and the fifteenth, the twentieth, the twenty-fifth, and then we'll just average them together. We could do a weighted average if we want it. Maybe we'll find that it's actually useful to weight this 15th one more uh, than the others, for example. And then the loss with respect to a particular feature map, because this is a feature map, right, is going to be, well, what are we going to do? We're going to calculate the, let's say, L for our layer. And then we're going to go ahead and say, whatever our layer is, we're going to just calculate the gram matrix of A and L for the I combination. And we're going to compare that against. So we will just take style, feed it in, pull out the ELF activation, compute the gram matrix. Take the combination image here, feed it in, take out the activation at the same layer, compute the gram matrices of both of those, now do a mean squared error between those. And it's really going to be, uh, I guess, an average mean squared error, or a sum of the mean squared errors, right? Because we've got pointwise mean squared errors there. That is our style loss. Once we have our style loss, we've already seen our content loss. We, again, do a weighted sum between those, and that's our total loss. And then, as we talked about, we just go back and do the gradient descent. And this gives us exactly this, where we take a content image, we take a style image, and we apply the style to the content. And this is not tuned for Van Gogh and this particular image. This same process works for many content images and many style images. It turns out the style images work best if they're very uh, stylistic, so to speak. Uh, so if you have a very uh, a style image that doesn't have much style to it, uh, this doesn't is not as impressive. But if you've uh, got something like Van Gogh, where it's very there's a very clear style to it, then that shows up in the combination image.